So this is the much anticipated Peugeot 508 GT line. Beautiful, beautiful car. Absolutely gorgeous in every respect. But if you look at the market trends, completely unwanted. A small SUV is what everybody wants, but Peugeot's already launched all that. It's already done, the 2008, 3008 and so on are all done. This is where it's at with Peugeot right now. They're again ahead of the curve ever so slightly with their saloon offering. But can this really compete in a market with the Passat, Mondeo, 3 Series, Audi A4? There's just a list of big players in that market. And here we have this. Really, this car has some serious competition and more competition to come. So what we're gonna do is try and find out whether this is the car that you should spend your money on because I think it's bite the back of your hand gorgeous. Or whether you should save your money and wait till next year. Let's find out by having a look on the inside. Make sure you hit that subscribe button because you know what? It's good for your health. And health is what matters really when you think about the actual end goal of the day. This is the interior of the 508. You'll have noticed by now that the windows are actually pillarless around the edge. So there's no frame. Frameless, not pillarless, frameless. Uh, there's no frame around the edge of the window. Um, and there's a good thunk there as well. Also, you'll notice that there's a small steering wheel in this one. And the instrument binnacle is above the steering wheel rather than behind the steering wheel where it would normally be. I'm not a big fan of this steering wheel arrangement. I get used to it, but it doesn't mean I actually kind of like it. I just get used to it. I think they've done this to give us something to talk about. And instead of doing that, they should have just given us a car that will drive the way this one drives with a normal size steering wheel. That's my own opinion. Materials used across the top are actually pretty sharp. They're not soft touch stuff. They are actually kind of harder wearing plastics, which is pretty much, that's, a, that's an okay thing. Then you have this mock carbon fiber effect. That's all around the edge as well. That's fine. Uh, coming down here as well, you have a glove box on this side, which is the usual Peugeot problem of being tiny and barely able to contain its own manual. Uh, and it always is tiny. Storage has always been a problem in the 508. If you're buying the older one, there's basically no storage in the cabin. But this one has actually got some good storage. There's a door bin over here. There's a large pocket in the middle that will contain a mobile phone. There's a charger I put into that there. It's able to contain all of that. 12 volt socket in there. Uh, under this, there is another massive glove box in here which contains my sunglasses and there's lights in there. Is that an aux connector? There's an aux connector in there. Uh, slightly unnecessary today. Uh, there is USB ports, and I'm going to point something out here. So there's one on this side, and there's one over there on that side. But the one on that side, because this is normally a left-hand drive car, the one on that side runs the Apple CarPlay, and the one on this side is just a charger. You need to look at that Peugeot. They need to be changed sides or make both of them Apple CarPlay. This one does nothing. This one runs the Apple CarPlay because the car is normally driven from that side. I pressed the horn there as well. Uh, the car is normally driven from that side. Anyway, coming down to the center, I have this, the center uh, infotainment screen here. I'll come back to that in a minute. There's drive modes, a start button, a gear stick. I don't know what that reminds me of. What do you think it reminds you of? Whatever it reminds you of is there. Leave me a message in the comments. Tell me what you think that reminds you of. Uh, then you have the park and brake. Then you got two cup holders with decent size. I'm about that glove box again. On the steering wheel, I have volume controls, and then I have the. I'm able to change this interim binnacle over here, and then I got some controls over here. Behind the steering wheel is the active cruise control controls, and then flappy paddle box, and that's about it, really. Uh, when you start it up, it doesn't start. Now, I just want to draw your attention to this as well. I'm sure someone's going to tell me that this is a safety thing, right? That doesn't start the engine. No. Same for turning it off. So when I want to turn it off, it's not just, look, do you understand? You have to hold it down to turn it off. Someone in the comments is going to go, da, 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 I think you'll find that that's a safety thing. Well, it isn't really. It's annoying because sometimes you think the car is turned completely off and you're getting out and it goes, bing, 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 to tell you the car is still running because the active cruise or active uh, start stop system is cut in. Uh, now I have to do my worst thing because the air conditioners come on, it's loud. I have to press the button for air conditioning and then I have to press the button for minus to turn the bloody fan down. Because it's in there, lads. That's a big no. That's a demerit point. You shouldn't have the air conditioning controls on a touch screen. It should be out here on a knob. Bring back the knobs. The t-shirt available in my Teespring store. Uh, 
should be available on a knob down here and that's it. There's just no alternative for it. I have no interest whatsoever in the touchscreen. It doesn't work. It's usually annoying. Also on the touchscreen though, I have entertainment, which brings you into the radio. You can choose your sources from here. You can go to your phone, your Bluetooth, your Apple CarPlay, only on this side of the car. Uh, you can do your Apple CarPlay. Then you have the air conditioning. Then you have the sat nav, which is very good. If a little hard to find your destination, it's a bit confusing here and there. There are points that that doesn't quite work. Then you go into the car menu, allows you to turn on and off parking sensors, automatic headlamp dipping, under inflation, all sorts of. Then you're into the phone. Then you're into the apps for the connected apps, Mirror Link, Android Auto, Apple CarPlay is all in there. And then I think, I don't know what that does. It's a personal experience, it's called. So it's iCockpit Amplify. And you can choose your ambience, ambience. Uh, of which you can have relax or boost. Boost turns everything red, and then when you press it again, you go back to relax over here, which turns everything sort of a silvery color. I don't know what else it does. It just seems to change the color of the dash and things. Mm, interesting, I suppose, a little gimmick. It's not like it having a little gimmick in a car. Um, beneath that, I do have some air conditioning controls, so I can turn the air conditioning completely off. The start-stop system completely off. Uh, which is actually, these are kind of screens rather than being buttons, they're not physical buttons. Um, and then of course you can do your drive mode, uh, you can go normal, eco, sport, and that's kind of it. Instrument binnacle up here gives you a good readout, you actually can change that readout to be like navigation will come over here. So this side over this side is quite um, uh, unique, it, it shows you bits, it's, it's really a clever screen, you can really start messing around with it change the dials down to minimum and change the dials up to all sorts of little detail and things in it it's very good i really like that little adaptation stuff that you can kind of play with in here 99 percent of is going to put it onto the whatever default mode it is and just leave it at that you won't change it again but if you change that wheel there you get that eye cockpit thing and on the far side of the steering wheel then you can change your uh, radio stations or you can change whatever list of so this bit controls that this bit controls that because this steering wheel is normally over there and that will control what's near it see 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 I always think about that sort of thing some things are not changed over in the middle of it uh, lovely frameless rear view mirror and the cabin itself is actually quite good seats are pretty comfortable there's a leather strip down the center of this one which is slightly uncomfortable uh, but the rest of it is actually quite comfortable in here um, the cabin itself is good if a little dark on this side of it but I do like it I love the gear stick it's just a cool looking thing uh, and the, the car seems to work pretty well. We come back to the engine in a few minutes. Right now, we're going to move on to the back seat. See how people you can fit in there. Oh, yeah, turn off the car. Oh, yeah, look at that. I held it down and I turned off the car, that thing. Pretty good, huh? So, back door bit here has a bit that sticks out, and then the actual headroom getting in is like properly sideways. Once you're in, once you get past this slope and roof line, you're fine. And you're in. The other thing I want to report is it's pitch black in here. Like it's dark back here. But there is plenty of room. So there's me set up. I have a fist between me and the seats in front of me. It's quite roomy. I have two uh, five volt chargers down here and two vents here that can control the airflow but no temperature gauges. And I can't turn them off. I can close them. It doesn't blow air back here. But I can't really turn them off. There is a small uh, door pocket over here. And then you have a nice armrest in the center with two cup holders in it. Nothing else, just an armrest. There is a ski loader lift straight through to the boot, which is very useful. I was in Ikea yesterday. Uh, and then you can drop the seats really easily from just one click on the button. That's very straightforward. And then you can load all the way through into the lift back, which is tons of space in there as well. You basically turn this into a van fairly quickly with the, with the seats all flat and uh, the tunnel cover taken out really straightforward and it going back up just as easy as well there you go locked in and the seatbelt doesn't go behind it look at that there is two isofix on the back here three seat belts you will maybe get a child in the middle you're not going to get an adult in there for very long it is really a four seat uh, gt car the rest of it is pretty good to the lift back boot so as we come to the boot, I am told by Peugeot Ireland that the boot lids you'll get will be electric lift. This one isn't. It's a kind of an early production version of it. And so this one is a manual lift, but it's actually not that heavy uh, when you're opening it up. It's a one button right here and you just push up 
can does the rest itself anyway. So not a big deal, but uh, they will, as standard, will have an electric tail lift. The boot in here, this one has an optional rubber rubber covering in here, which I would suggest, unless you're going to carry really mucky, wet, crap looking boots, I wouldn't bother with it. It's quite slippy, so things slide around on it really easy. And so every time you brake, everything slides forward, and everything you accelerate, everything slides backward. Uh, and underneath is a nice carpet. Now, under the carpet, there is, I guarantee, a spare wheel. Peugeot put a spare wheel in every car, and I do like that. Very important it's in there. Uh, we got free packet of cabbage buttons and some other uh, Easter-related material in the boot. I don't know who put them in there. But left over from the last press car <laughs> rotation, I think. Anyway, the boot here is commodious. You get a 12-volt socket on that side. There is a single one shopping bag hook on the left side. I don't know why it's not on the right side, but it is on the left side. But it is there. There's one there, so I'll pass it that test. Anyway, right, that boot is pretty good. Now we're going to find out what it's like to drive the 1.5-litre diesel. So make sure you hit the subscribe button. I've asked you that before. If you haven't done it already, then I'll come around your house, find out who you are, and press the subscribe button for you. Let's go! So do not adjust your sets. It is actually this dark in here. I tried to adjust the lighting so you can see more of the back things, but it's black. Like it's pretty dark over here. But that's there's massively tinted windows here as well. Of course, we're dealing with that. Country roads, boys. Here's a big massive Ferguson tractor coming barreling down here with a trailer on. How are you going? Good lad. By the way, in Ireland, if you're uh, driving along and you put up one finger, it means I don't know you, but I'm saying hello anyway. If I put up a whole hand, I do know you, and I'm saying hello. So this is the Peugeot 508, and it's the 1.5 litre HDI engine that Peugeot put into things. 130 horsepower, they say, give or take. Uh, it never feels that troubled. It is coupled to an 8-speed box, which does sometimes feel troubled on the motorway. It flicks between 7th and 8th quite a lot. And then when you want to accelerate or overtake anything on a motorway, it flicks back down to 6th out of nowhere and just starts to roar at you. But now that's just, it's the way the setup of the car is designed to do that. So I have to trust Peugeot that they know what they're doing with fuel economy because the car is reporting to me that it's doing 5.4 litres per 100 kilometres. That's really good. Uh, I've done 181 kilometres in the car and uh, my current information is I can do another 740 kilometers. So give or take, if the car is right, around 900 kilometers to 1,000 kilometers on a tank of diesel. Can't really complain too much about that. So the steering wheel upsets my brain a lot because the steering wheel is so small and it's very hard to compare it to other cars the way they drive because everyone else has got a normal size steering wheel and the steering wheel is all you touch in a car almost all the time, particularly in an automatic car where you're not grabbing at the gear stick the whole time. So because you do that, you've got all these different textures on it. It's flat leather up here, it's textured leather down the sides, it's flat on the bottom, it's flat on the top and bottom. It's it's complicated, Peugeot. Honestly, the problem is that you just have to work so hard to wrap your head around this little tiny steering wheel and stuff. It's very hard to get used to. And that means, of course, owners are going to get into a car and go, oh no, I don't like this little steering wheel. So instead of that, should I put in a full-size steering wheel and be done with it? Because the car actually handles really well. It's crisp, it turns in well, it remains flat through the corners, and it responds quite well to aggressive moves. You know, when you put your foot down and you turn in very hard on a corner, it does actually respond to that quite well. It levels out, it cushions the road nicely. Being a French car, it should be desperately comfortable. That's always the key of a French car. If you're a French car manufacturer out there and you're even considering making the cars even remotely uncomfortable, don't. It'll be absolutely, catastrophically business suicide. Uh, make a car that's comfortable first, lads. This car is definitely very comfortable. It is a really nice and pleasant driving grip, gripping mileage on. Um, this is the fairly standard spec. It's going to vary a little bit. This one's an early production model, so there's a couple of things that are missing off this. There are actually a couple of things that are on this that won't be on your standard spec. But you can expect to pay about four, a little over 40 grand for this car. So it's in the range of, we'll say, some of the Audi stuff, lower end of the Audi stuff, uh, and BMWs and 3 Series and the whole lot. It's in there. Now, I think the 3 Series is the best car to drive at the moment, but it's absolutely gorgeous. Buy it rear wheel drive only. This one actually rides really well. I'm really surprised how well it feels inside, but I'm 
kind of overwhelmed by the electronic and tech that's involved in the car the eight speed box the little tiny steering wheel the, the, the instrument binnacle that's above the steering wheel it just sort of overwhelms the experience of how good a car this actually is underneath the chassis the suspension the gearbox all class now speaking of which that little 1.5 dci actually does a good job of moving this thing around you wouldn't think that something so small as 1.5 should be able to shuffle something around like this because it's a great big saloon but it does look where she goes it's a bit clattery and noisy but you're actually trading off a bit of sound and noises for fuel economy as 5.1 liters per kilometers is about as good as you're going to get from any of these cars the 508 is in showrooms right now i do like it it is definitely worth your time if you're considering any sort of three box saloon effort because it is outstandingly pretty this color is actually called ultimate red in case you're wondering uh, and it is around 40 grand for this car and it's definitely worth a look at any point hopefully you have learned everything you need to know about this beautiful 508 and if you haven't what were you watching uh you will should have at this point hit the subscribe button but if you haven't i'd really love it if you did um, and hopefully you have enjoyed this entire review you can find the support buttons down below until the next time i will see you on the far side